Well, welcome to Dementia Chats, everybody. I am Lori LeBay, and I'll be facilitating this conversation along with my co-facilitator, uh, Elon Caspi. Uh, we have four people with us living with dementia. I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves. And today's topic, I think, is going to be an interesting one. You know, there's been a lot of excitement and uh, controversy over the new Alzheimer's drug that just got approved. And we're just going to talk from personal experience on on what our thoughts and feelings are of this particular drug. Would it be something that individuals would feel comfortable at this point taking or not? And again, we're, we're not trying to sway anybody's opinion one way or the other or judge. But, you know, from my recollection, and again, I don't read everything or see everything that's out in the news, but I haven't seen the voice of dementia uh, be asked what their thoughts are. And I think it's really important to be heard. So um, for those of you that are new, my mom had dementia for 30 years, and that's what got me into this space. I created Alzheimer's Speaks, Dementia Chats is, you know, one of our offshoots there. Uh, and again, the whole point of Dementia Chats is to raise the voice of those living with dementia. True, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Full legal name is Truthful Loving Kindness. Um, I've had dementia symptoms for 20 years now. And um, my diagnosis was changed to mild cognitive impairment because it's going so slow. And um, I have vascular and Lewy body symptoms, and I blog, and I'm very involved in Dementia Mentors and Dementia Chats. Great. Thank you. Paul Ann? Hi, my name is Paul Ann Gordon, and I was diagnosed with vascular dementia nine years ago, and I am um, a very ad active advocate with working with both um, Dementia Mentors and Dementia Action Alliance. And uh, I'm just thrilled to be here today. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, Jennifer. I'm Jennifer. I used to be a doctor and quite academic in those days, but not anymore. <laughs> I developed symptoms in my late 50s and had to take early retirement and I passionately believe that we can improve how we live with dementia. And I'm very much involved in England with the media, TV, radio, um, all kinds of groups and forums around the place. And I love people. I live in a dementia inclusive village now because I can't do anything that's sensible by myself anymore. <laughs> Great, thank you. Craig? Hi, my name's Craig Hankey. I'm from Wisconsin. Um, I was diagnosed in 2013 with Lewy body dementia and Parkinsonism symptoms. Um, that was changed this past December to mild cognitive impairment with dementia, with, I'm sorry, with uh, Lewy body traits or symptoms, I guess. But so just like Chu was saying, my the way they told me it wasn't happening, how it's happening, it, it's it's not going nearly as fast as what they said. Um, I'm involved in Dementia Action Alliance and a few things, um, Dementia Mentors also. And like Jennifer says too, I'm trying to live with this disease, but be enjoyable about doing it. Thank you. And Elon. Hi, my name is Elon Caspi. I, uh started in the aging field as a nurse aide in a nursing home where my grandfather lived. Both my grandmothers had dementia. Um, I, um, all my work and research and advocacy has to do with the human rights and dignity and safety of, of people living with dementia. I'm here to learn from your lived experience, your thoughts, and, shared, and share a little bit about what I learned along the way. Thank you. Elon, why don't you go ahead and kick this off and um, kind of give us a little bit of, of overview regarding this drug approval, and then we'll go in and, and ask our panelists some of their thoughts. As um, many of you know, recently the uh, U.S. FDA approved a drug uh, that is called Aduhelm, the drug was approved despite 
FDA's own advisory committee in which 11 of the 12 members voted against the approval of the drug uh, with the 12th member uh, voting as uncertain. So none of FDA's own advisory committee voted to support the drug. And the drug uh, was, um, there were a couple of trials that failed and then later on Biogen, the company went back and showed some sub-analysis uh, that showed some um, very modest effect for uh, a subgroup of the individuals participating in the trial. And if I recall correctly, the effect was a delay of about uh, four months of um, disease progression in early, very early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Now, the drug was uh, approved for all stages of, of the disease, which, is, which raises um, questions uh, in and of itself. The other issue is that there were uh, many very concerning side effects uh, for a substantial portion of the uh, people who participated in the study. Uh, the study, the, the drug is also extremely expensive, estimated at $56,000 a year for an individual that will take it. And this is before adding on costs that have to do with neuroimaging, uh, diagnostics, um, and other uh, logistics that have to do with, um, with, this, with this process. And uh, important to recognize that the it is a majority of the cost uh, will be shouldered by uh, the public, by taxpayers, uh, through uh, the Medicare program. And I think that another thing that people need to take into consideration is that the FDA uh, used what is called a conditional approval, which uh, allows pharmaceutical companies to uh, conduct additional clinical trials. And here is the, the key uh, issue over the next nine years. Nine years is a very long, very long period to have a, basically an open check uh, where the public will pay the bill for the most part to prove the effectiveness and safety of the drug. A lot of people don't know that even those conditional approvals are historically uh, remain many of them remained in the market. Those drugs remained in the market and distributed widely, uh, despite failing even in, in those subsequent conditional trials. So there's a reality on the ground, and you know I think it all comes down to another cost that I see. In other words, is trust. You know what are we doing as a society to increase rather than decrease? the trust that we have in biomedical science, in the FDA, and in the Alzheimer's Association that vigorously supported the approval of this drug. And, um, you know, I can talk more about many reports that I'm seeing in other countries, you know, such as in my country from Israel, where experts uh, are commenting on the drug with all the reservations that I just described and others, but often you see reports that also provide incomplete information. So they, don't, they may not say certain parts of the approval that are very important, such as the fact that it was um, examined for early stage Alzheimer's, but it was approved for all stages of Alzheimer's. And uh, one of the concerns is that there's a lot of talk about removal of amyloids and plaques from the brain, uh, but it is highly questionable whether removal of the amyloids and plaques could actually make a substantial clinical day-to-day -day effect on individuals in their lives. So, you know, I can go on and on, but I, I really want to hear from you. And speaking extensively with people who live with dementia is not a good idea, which I just did. So I'm going to stop now. And I want to ask you, what are, what are your thoughts about the drug? There's a reality where a lot of families and, and individuals, as, as, as you know better than anybody else, struggle with the disease on a daily basis and they look for hope. But is it real hope or is it a false hope? And is it an, an ethical, responsible decision? I, want, I hope that the, the issue of trust will come up, come up in the conversation to, today 
that is so critically important uh, in this conversation, I believe. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here and ask your thoughts. So why don't we start with just hearing that overview? How does that make you feel? And, and what are your initial thoughts? And then we can kind of dive into that. Jennifer, I'll, I'll go with you first. Good. Well, I'm glad what, what you said what you said. I utterly agree with you. And one of my great concerns is this business of trust that the, I feel there has been false reporting as well as incomplete reporting. And people who desperately want hope will have had this unfair, false hope brought to them. And when eventually it must be realized it isn't there, will that dent their trust in other medication, other treatment, the medical profession research? So that really does concern me. I don't know where it leaves the FDA, apart from knowing that three people have resigned over it, do I? Um, And I thought the amyloid hypothesis was thrown out several years ago. I've never believed in it ever. I have a bit of a rebel with my medical evidence-based background, but I've always considered amyloid as the result, not the cause. So we know from other medical conditions, if we just remove the result, it doesn't get rid of the cause, does it? So I'm sorry about that. So I'm, I'm distressed by it. I'm also angry as well, <laughs> but I'm glad there are people like Efron and are, there are other professionals who are trying to say something, but I hope it's not too late. But there is hope, and I'm sure other people on the panel will say that there are there is great hope in other spheres. So let's follow that line. Thank you, Craig. How about you? You know, listening uh, to Elon and and kind of his explanation of all the different variables out there, and I mean, and he just touched kind of the tip of the iceberg, <laughs> really, with this whole thing. Well, how did that make you feel? What are your thoughts? The whole. COVID vaccine thing makes me question the FDA's approval on things. Mm -hmm. I believe when the first drug first came out, I think it was Gary LeBlanc was talking about it, saying that they touted it as a cure for Alzheimer's. But then after a couple of weeks, it became realized that it's not a cure. It's just the same thing they have with the other drug that came out, I think it was 20 years ago. And it just keeps things in check, possibly. So I don't know a lot about it. I heard heard different t- topics. I've heard things on the news, but like Jennifer was saying, if three people resign because of it and um, how they voted on it, it makes me question if it's just a uh, snake oil. Yeah, for three people to resign, that, that's a pretty serious step, and people have to feel pretty dedicated you know, to their, their path in order to, to give up a job that is so critically important. And, and basically, uh, you know, the statements I heard, I mean, it was all based on ethics and, you know, the process of, of kind of crumbling there. I'm glad that you brought up how you saw it presented originally or how you heard it was presented originally as kind of this cure. And now it's, it's stepped back, especially when, you know, the target was initially early onset. Now they're going everybody. And so are they going to start paying doctors to push this drug, you know, do the incentives that we've heard, you know, that have happened with other things? Um, what are people's true motives on this? I mean, it's kind of like a an open live trial on, on everybody, but will the data really even be collected, you know, properly and, and looked at. So I, I think there's a lot of things out there. Um, Pauline, how about you? How did, how did it make you feel? Well, uh, I always like to start out with the positive. And the positive to me is that it, this will raise heightened awareness about Alzheimer's and it will, um, you know, hope maybe it will stir other people to, to do some more research and see, you know, what they can find. But um, I mean, that's the biggest, I think, good point coming out of this whole event. I, I'm skeptical about the drug for, you know, all the reasons that have been mentioned. And I, I feel for the people, I know somebody who is planning on, you know, participating in the, uh, in the trials. And I, um, 
you don't want to say anything, but um, I did say mention something, and and he said that about the brain. You know, he said there were no side effects, and I said, well, they do have seen some side effects. You know, in terms of the brain bleeds and things like that, but that's as far as I could go with that. And you know, you don't want to. I mean, he has this hope for a cure, and. I, I, I think it's a, I hate to see people manipulated, you know, who are suffering and really want help. And that, that upsets me, I think, probably more than anything about the whole thing. I, I don't have a lot of confidence in it, um, in the drug itself, just because of the different things I've heard. We've heard about it. And the people who have resigned, you know, from the FDA or from the committee and all of that as a result of it. I think, um, and I just hate to see it play on people's heartstrings. You know, people who are desperate for a cure, you know, if, uh, following something that could be very risky, you know, and, and the cost, you know, is, fun, is unbelievable. And we can't afford that, you know. so. I mean, my main thing is that I hope that um, this heightens awareness. I think that's a really good point. Um, it, it is bringing attention to dementia and the lack of, of new therapies, you know, that are that have been brought up. I know one of the things we wanted to um, maybe talk about too with this, and, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but you know, what you could do with alternative therapies in terms of care and helping people live a better quality life versus this kind of roulette game of maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. But in the meantime, we're going to pick your pocket and we're going to get your hopes up. And, um, you know, it's, it is, it's, it is just scary. And it, to me, kind of brings that divide out of who's got money and who doesn't because affordability is not equal. Then we'll go to true. Because of stuff that happened when I was a teenager and stuff for 30 years, I don't have a lot of faith in the medical process. And this definitely does not strengthen that faith <laughs> and trust. I, I mean, I understand that, that medical professionals are also practicing. There is no such thing as perfect knowledge in people. And, um, but this seems like an extreme push of that, I have seriously questioned the validity of the theory of amyloid being the cause. I think much more efforts need put into which is the cause and which is the effect before solutions are portrayed as giving hope. Um, also, I, from what I recall, there was a very large percent of persons who at the point of, at the point of autopsy had more than one type of dementia progressing in their brain. So what about probably a lot of people who know about the oh my brain the type of dementia that this is supposed to treat a alzheimers but don't realize about vascular dementia if they've got vascular dementia growing or advancing also and those side effects could be totally disastrous. Oh, but as a basic, I avoid thinking about it because I don't want to involve myself in something that is just stressful and not something I am going to take action on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elon? I, I actually do believe in, in, in biomedical research. Uh, and 
I actually do believe that the COVID vaccines um, were a result of a biomedical science that probably saved a lot of lives. And we don't know, there could be different opinions here and that's okay, but that's just my personal belief. And, you know, credit is due when credit is due. You know, uh, I'm doing a lot of research in nursing homes and we know that how many people have died in nursing homes due to COVID uh, in biomedical science, if it would be, um, or soon visiting with their families in those nursing homes and in the community. But I, I don't wanna go in that direction unless you want to, but uh, I wanna say that, you know, the medication, let's, let's leave for a second all the negative things that were reported in the media and the New York Times and other experts about the medication. But the fact that the medication prolonged the disease progression by four months can, can have value to some people who, 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 who think that there's value in their life for those four months. And, that, and I, who am I to, to judge that? I mean, this is their choice. I, I get it. But I believe, and I believe that Lori, and I can't speak for you, Lori, but you know, from everything that we know from psychosocial research, from personalized psychosocial approaches for in terms of the critical need for an infrastructure, a nationwide infrastructure for early detection, for emotional support, for psychological support, for education, for removal of stigma um, and the fear about the disease, you know, and engaging in, in enabling people, giving them the, the opportunities with, with real rights to engage with life, to be part of life, to be part of communities, to engage with nature, to engage in things they enjoy to do, um, can, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that you can delay disease progression much, much more than four months, much, much more. And that's, to me, that's so painful because millions of families, not only in the US, this drug is gonna be distributed in many other countries, right? So instead of, what I wish would have happened uh, is to invest it in what is desperately needed yesterday and, and that infrastructure, nationwide infrastructure. Um, uh, and, and instead, our society chose to go down that route. My hope is that there will be somebody in Congress that will wake up and realize what just happened and, and reverse it, have the courage and the leadership and the political clout uh, to reverse this decision, um, but I, I, this is only this is only my hope, uh, and I'm just going to leave it at that. We know from uh, you know there's a book called Alzheimer's Conundrum: Entanglements of, of Aging and Dementia. Professor Margaret Locke from uh, and Professor Emerita from um, Canada. She interviewed 80 researchers over four and a half years. And uh, she, the, the conclusions, two conclusions of the book, one from the interviews, one is that the amyloid cascade hypothesis is highly questionable. And as uh, Jennifer alluded to, you know, it's, and I think that metaphor was in the book, you know, if you see a car accident and you see the debris, you don't treat the debris. The debris is the, is the result, is not necessarily the cause. So again, are we honest with the public slash we are, there's trust at stake, literally trust at stake here. And, and the second part is what the conclusion of the book is what we need is a public health preventative approach of all the lifelong risk factors of Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. So, and I'm gonna leave you with the question, why is it, talking about social determinants of health, talking about racism, why is it that African-Americans in this society uh, have, twice the rate of whether it's Alzheimer's or vascular dementia. And why is it that Hispanics have 1.5 higher uh, rate of um, Alzheimer's and perhaps vascular dementia compared to whites? And I think sometimes you don't need to be a scientist. You need to use common sense. And I'm just going to leave it, leave it here and, and just hear your thoughts. Uh, Paul Lamp? Well, this is n not especially particularly on what you were just speaking about, but I, I think one of the things that is really 
uh, an important thing to talk about is where this money could be going um, if it weren't going to um, this drug. And, you know, the, the, the money that could be going to support people living with various forms of dementia is just unbelievable in terms of services and maybe, uh, you know, helping them with assisted living or whatever they need, you know, care, in-home care. And I think that this is, this is an issue that is really big. I totally agree. Dom, Jennifer and then Craig. I agree. <laughs> I agree with, you know, what's been said, but um, there was some research done, the finger study. Um, I don't remember when that was, about five, six years at least, wasn't it, ago? You know, the F stands for Finnish. <laughs> and that was I, Israel. It was an international study, wasn't it, that showed that other things made a tremendous difference, not drugs. <laughs> you know, your diet, you know, bring your blood pressure down, however that was done, and exercise and cognitive, you know, stimulation and all this kind of stuff. It showed that that made a tremendous difference to people. But maybe, you know, cost has something to do with it because that's free, isn't it? So <laughs> this is our society. It seems the more you pay for something, the better it must be. And this is certainly not true. So, I mean, I agree it would be wonderful if that the money that is possibly going to be spent on this new drug, which I have no faith in at all, <laughs> if it was spent in other ways, it could make a huge difference. But would society ever accept that? Because they don't seem to value things that are free. Effort isn't free, is it? <laughs> well, I think that's a great point. And, and part of it is we want easy. You know, it's like, I, I want a pill. I don't want to exercise. I want to change my diet. I, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't have time for that. Just give me a dang pill. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the society that we live in and that someone else is supposed to be responsible for us. We also don't have a system, especially here in the US of being healthy, creating healthy, you know, um, bodies. I mean, you look at even all the cures and people are gonna think, boy, she's anti-pharma. And I'm not necessarily anti-pharma, but you know, we're putting a lot of stuff in our bodies that has side effects as well it, you know it comes out this way that way and now you need another pill because of you know now you have this and there are there are benefits to these psychosocial therapies that are out there that far past just even the person who's doing it it affects their family it affects their friends because it affects their relationship it, it affects their thought process their well-being um, all of those types of things, it, it has that ripple effect, kind of like, you know, we all uh, have seen the um, Alive Inside music video, where, you know, he comes alive or with validation with Naomi File as she's, you know, singing with the gal. And, and they just kind of become one. I mean, there, there's just this energy and the whole room changes, their belief system changes, you know, because of these things. And, and people aren't valuing that intricate piece of what relationships to life mean. You know, if that's a physical relationship with another person, if it's a relationship with, you know, the universe or plants or art or whatever it might be, those things, you know, make chemical changes in our body, you know, that, that help us be better and, um, and, and, and to me be more content um, be happy, you know, and I would like to see people really starting to focus on, I guess what I learned with my mom, I was like really task oriented and I have to do this and I have to do that. And it was, it was all about things to do. And I think the world is really focused on, you know, we have to have a cure instead of sitting back and, and saying something real simple, which to me changed how I cared in my whole relationship with my mom and I think her quality of life. And that was, was she safe? Was she happy? Was she pain-free? How do I create an environment that gives her those three things? And everybody in the world can participate in that. Everyone can make a difference in that. And, and those are the things that we're not talking about. Instead, 
you know, we kind of, we, we kind of get into this position of there's no cure, there's no hope. And yet there are so many beautiful moments that can be created, but they have to be created and they have to be supported to, to be created on multiple levels. I'm going to go to um, Craig first, because I know he has to hop off here and then I'll come to you, True. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say pretty much the same thing that Paul Ann was saying too. Um, and I agree with what Jennifer was saying. I have to wonder, I, I think what Paul is saying might, might work. This might open people's eyes to how big this Alzheimer's is. And maybe there'll be some more funding put towards research. Um, if they would have spent, if they would spent some of the money that they spent bringing the drug around into more, more research, I think that would have been a better, uh, better idea. But I look at what they all spent and all the research that was done in the COVID vaccines. And they don't have a cure, but it's totally people at bay. But I wonder if any of that, if they could do the same thing with dementia research, with the amount of money that they spent, the amount of people working on it, if they could come up with an actual cure for it. But that's not going to be done unless people have to pay, pay into the tax system for the uh, let the officials to actually put forth any funding for the research. So I just, I just question that if they can spend the money on, on a COVID vaccine, how come they can't spend any more money on research and other diseases like uh, dementia or, or cancer? Uh, and then with what Elan was saying, um, I have to wonder if, I know a lot of black people were didn't want to get this back COVID vaccine because I guess back in the 40s, maybe 50s, they were, they were treated as like guinea pigs with different vaccines. So the trust issue is a big deal with them. And I wonder if they also don't trust doctors that they would have to see to be treated um, before it gets any worse, the dementia gets any worse. So I just wonder if that would be a possible reason why there's so high in blacks and Spanish people. Well, and it's interesting too on that, on that mark, because I mean, you just look at who we've got here. We don't have representation. Um, and no matter how hard we try to pull those voices in, it's really tough, you know, um, to, to get them to trust, to be part of the group. I know the, the groups that I see and that I work with, um, and many others, you know, are, are trying to get representation and get their voice heard and, and pull them in. I don't know if that's any difference, you know, for you in the UK, Jennifer, in terms of being more diverse, in terms of representation of, of people living with dementia. Yes, it is. I have been involved with one group up in London, which did have people from different um, backgrounds and color, which was very good. But it's not it's the it's the a rarity rather than the commonplace, which is strange because um, we know it happens across all divides, doesn't it? In the same way as there's been a lot of publicity in England, you know, the number of doctors of ethnic minorities who've died, and it can't be anything to do with their social housing and lack of education, can it? So it is a lot to do with with trust, the, how they feel as well. You know, we know how we feel. We will welcome them, but it's also how they feel, isn't it? But so no, I, it's a little bit, perhaps, and more. And we do in dementia. We have oh, help! What's her name? Terry. She joins in a lot of things, doesn't she? Um, and there's someone else too. I can't remember, but yes. Ryan. In in America, yes. So mm -hmm. there are there are people really. You know, but, you're not. Yeah. But but number wise, ratio wise, it's it's yes, pretty small. And um, you know what I what I am seeing is more groups popping up that are specific to them, which is which is fine. But I'd still like to see collaboration between us all because we need to know the differences and the similarities, and because uh, I think we can give each other comfort in that in that mode. True. How about you? What I had written is drive for the technical aspect of medicine, objective testing and less reliance 
on doctor opinion or on doctor um, doctor's conclusions unless it is part of a a, a um, physical something that can be seen and measured. It is really mostly being thrown out of the bailiwick, not considered now. And in the same way, I think people are more wanting things that are solutions that are technical, solutions that are cut and dried, this, 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 not Oh, well, if you combine this with this and that, you get this new picture. That's not what they want. I think people in general, not just the medical profession, are more going toward wanting one piece solutions. I agree with you and I disagree with you on that because I do think everybody wants simple. But I do see a raise in elevation in terms of, you know, like Jennifer mentioned with the finger study, with the exercise, with the diet, with if people are starting to take those things more seriously. You know, I would love to see more research on social engagement and how does that enhance people's lives? I, I think that that is, is critically important. And I, and I think we're seeing a expansion in terms of research that's being done where social engagement isn't poo-pooed so much anymore. And there are more studies being done on, you know, what does music do? What does, uh, you know, if it's sleep or arts or whatever it is. Um, and I, I think we're going to see a lot of power, but I, you know, for me, it's going way too slow. <laughs> you know, I, I like to see that speed up. I do think some things are changing out there and it's going to be very interesting to watch this drug and what happens with it you know who really takes up on this um what are what are you know some results they find from the tests um will it be like and i hate to say this but i'm going to because i i've seen this true with a with a few friends who have been in trials with with uh, cancer drugs and they won't do the pet scans because they don't want the documented results shown of is this treatment working or not and so i've had friends who are taking this medication and they have no proof if it's working or not uh you know several have felt much worse but they're told it's better and you know they'll do that test up front but they're not doing it at the end and i find that really really sad really sad and and maybe that was a fluke um i don't know but to me, it was a manipulated system that scares me on that. Elon? One of the concerning things uh, that I see is that for many years, in recent years, it became increasingly apparent that it is very difficult to recruit a large number of people with dementia into clinical trials. And so now we're entering a new phase that could take nine years, at least the pharmaceutical company received nine years to conduct those clinical trials. And so uh, a vast amount of people are gonna be sought out to be recruited into a clinical trial that ev evaluates a drug that um, so far at least has uh, very minimal uh, empirical evidence to support its, uh, its use. And so it's gonna dry out what is already dry uh, a desert, really, in terms of other medications that may have, uh, that may uh, focus on other mechanisms uh, and innovative uh, directions that, um, I mean, and again, it goes back to the amyloid cascade hypothesis is highly questionable. And I'm using conservative, conservative terms here. Uh, only yesterday, there was an article in the New York Times about centenarians, and many of them and, and they're fully cognitively intact. Or, you know, they might have mild something, you know, in memory issues, but and uh, by Jane Brody, I believe. And the article was written by her. And many of 
these participants' brains had a lot of amyloids and plaques, and that's not a new thing that we know about. So, and, and it is it is the blame of some media organizations that keep pushing that idea. And when the public doesn't know, they're left with being either neutral or supportive. So I guess my point was simple. When you, when it's already the pipeline, you know, the ability to recruit people with dementia to treat clinical trials is extremely difficult. The Awesome Association recognizes that for many years now. You're gonna divert a lot of those people now to a drug that has not shown confidence in terms of empirical evidence away from other, um, therapeutics that could perhaps work on other mechanisms that are um, more promising in terms of making a real impact in people's lives and, and even possibly with less side effects. So that's another layer of concern here. And Jennifer? Yes, am I allowed to say that that could be also to the advantage of the people who are promoting this particular drug? Because it means that they will be getting money for it meanwhile and isn't that perhaps motivating this imbalance? Well, you know, what was interesting, um, Elon, in the article you sent me, there was a, a Dr. Pearson from the ICER where they, they figure out incremental cost effectiveness ratio. And he said, by looking at the data, this drug should cost, what was it, 20, 25 to $8,300 instead of 56 thousand you know that alone just amazes me on you know how many things were changed in the process you know with this all maybe it'll turn out to be a miracle drug i, I would love to see that mm -hmm. I, I don't i don't think it's going to be and i and i do think the whole level of trust um in our system well heck in all of our systems these days is just being tested to the hilt in terms of you know, how things get pushed forward. I want to add one more thing real quick. I think the affordability issue is critical, you know, especially for populations who can't literally afford, right, to pay a fraction of that. But I will not, so, so what I'm going to say now is really on me. I'm taking full responsibility on what I'm going to say, and nobody needs to, you know, comment or relate. If you feel like that's fine, or I know this could be sensitive, but I'm not about, I'm not about that. I want to say it as it is. I think that you know people should know that the U.S. Alzheimer's Association vigorously supported this FDA approval. I think that, and I can say I'm very disturbed by that, but ethically, morally, financially, practically, clinically, uh, but I think that at the very least, the U.S. Alzheimer's Association owes a detailed account about the thinking process underlying this support of the drug. At the very least, the public deserves to know what led the Alzheimer's Association to decide to do that. And I have some guesses, but I'm really curious. And maybe they did it, and maybe I missed it. But I think that's a very basic, reasonable thing to expect from an organization that is very powerful in Congress, very powerful with the FDA, with pharmaceuticals, uh, and so I think that's a, that's a reasonable thing to ask. And um, because otherwise we don't know, we don't have a, a full sense of the role of the Alzheimer's Association um, uh, role and rational in supporting this, uh, this drug. Interesting comments. Uh, <laughs> Jennifer, no comment, just a, <laughs> just a nonverbal there. It would be interesting uh, to see if something like that was happened. Um, I, I don't know if their budgets are, are fully transparent or not. Um, I, yeah, Jennifer's going, nope. Um, to, to kind of see, you know, was there, was there a benefit, you know, for them on this? It's hard to, it's hard to say, but it gets people's minds going. And, um, and again, in this day and age that we're living with, the, the, the level of distrust seems to be building more and more and more. But like, as Paul Ann said, I think there will be some good things that come out of that. It's just going to take a while. Right. And, yeah. 
<clears throat> and it's going to cause a lot of stress and probably a lot of problems like we're seeing in just about every other area of our life. And I know our economics and government and religion and education. And, I mean, it, nothing has been left untouched, um, mm. it seems like. So, you know, I think it's going to force us to regroup and say what our priorities. And I hope that you know, with dementia, part of our priorities, again, is raising the awareness, finding, you know, figuring out the need, um, telling the true stories, and then also letting people know that as much as a cure is valued, so is quality of life in the meantime. And that, you know, that is affecting so many people too. And if we can reduce stressors and, and support people, you know, and, and pharma might not like to hear this and, and the healthcare, but there might be less pressure of cost if we can keep pe people comfortable, you know, in their homes and, um, you know, or if they're living in communities or adult day or I, I don't care what it is. But I think there's some, some real benefits to that that would pan out on multiple levels in multiple ways and allow people to be more purposeful, more productive, not only for themselves, but in their communities. And, and purpose is, is power, I think. True? One of my concerns is if and when this medicine fails, it will be a tremendously dramatic step in public, and at any rate, I'm afraid that support for other efforts on dementia is going to decrease because we already spent that money. We already invested all this and nothing happened. It was a failure. So we're dropping that and we're going to go on to other things that can't, something can be done about. And I think that's a legitimate concern, you know, and people will can can move on to the next thing. Hopefully they will say, hey, let's look at the process and why this happened and go back and, and really investigate that. Paul Ann? I just want to kind of end it by saying, you know, think about the people who are going to participate in these trials and think, or in taking the medication, I guess they're not trials anymore. Um, think about the people, I mean, they're desperate for a cure and this is what they're going to get and they're going to spend all of their savings and this is what they're going to get. Well, I agree with that. And I also think um, there's a risk of divide amongst those living with dementia. You know, um, there, there could end up being, you know, and I'd hate to say this because I think everybody wants the best for everybody else, but there could be some real resentment for people who can't afford it, who want to do it as well. Um, and, you know, I just don't want any of this to hurt the cause in terms of raising awareness and us being as, as one. I mean, we've, we've come together from, it's not just Alzheimer's, you know, it, we use the term dementia so much more. So we're inclusive of all the different types of dementias that are out there. Um, and I would just hate to see anything divide um, us as kind of our grassroots entities or organizations that we work with as a whole and break any of that down. Because, you know, I see that on Facebook it, when there can be a wedge between two individuals, it can be disruptive to a whole group. And, you know, we don't want to see, we don't want to see that happen. Elon? I'm sorry, that, that was a very important point, uh, Lori, from your perspective, perspective, seeing some of those tensions over the years. I'm so glad you brought it up. Related to trust, I think that there's something to be said. If we take a step back, there's something to be said, and I don't have ownership over truth, but there's something to be said about going back to basic honesty, you know? And this is, this is across the board. You know, this is the FDA. This is the pharmaceutical companies. And I'm not naive about some of the practices of the pharmaceutical companies. There's actually a whole book that was written about the pharmaceutical companies. I'm sure there's others. Uh, the truth about the drug companies, how they deceive us and what you can do about it. And it was actually written by a chief 
editor of a very, very prestigious uh, journal of medicine. And so she, as the chief editor, saw a lot of submissions over the years about drugs trials. So from her unique perspective, she wrote the book. So this has validity in my mind. It's not somebody, you know, anyways, I'll leave it here. But, but my, 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 what I was trying to convey is, can we please go to just basic, honest practices and communications uh, with the Alzheimer's Association that push strongly for this, with the FDA, with biomedical science, uh, with the pharmaceutical companies and other related entities and Congress, you know, where, where is the, and I, I, I want to think that somebody at Congress is, 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 has woken up over the past week and is very determined to do something about it. Maybe Elizabeth Warren, or, or I don't know, somebody who, or Bernie Sanders, you know, I mean, maybe somebody is doing something about it. I hope, I can't believe if not, but it, it's got to be done. But again, going back to, perceiving honesty as an asset that is crucial for trust. Without trust, we can't do anything. People say, oh, Elon likes to, criti to criticize the Alzheimer's Association. Well, I, I criticize the Alzheimer's Association because it's dear to me, because I believe that if they would strengthen the public's trust, they would be able to serve the population that they're serving a hundred times more. That is the reason why I'm criticizing the Alzheimer's, no other reason. So. Can we go back to honesty and along the sp in the spirit of authentic partnership? So what happened here, this major historical event after 18 years that no med Alzheimer's medication was approved, this is a historical moment that we can use to build the trust instead of further erode it. So I'm looking forward to leadership in, in, in any of those organizations and in Congress to take a hard look at the data and, and do something about it before it's too late. Any other last comments by people? True? Anything you'd like to say? No? Paul Ann? Jennifer? Well, as always, um, interesting conversation and, um, and perceptions from everybody. So I really, I, I appreciate people's honesty. I think that's how we move forward. And again, you know, I think we're stronger together. I think your voice is very important to be heard. And I, I don't think this will be the last time we, we hear about this topic. I think, you know, it's, it's something that affects everybody who has been affected by dementia, diagnosed family member, friend, professional, et cetera. And so I think all eyes and ears will be watching this and, and seeing what happens and uh, time will tell. But I do think it's important for us to state our opinions, right, wrong, or indifferent. We're all dealing, you know, with, with different amounts of, of background and knowledge, but I think voices need to be heard and, and listened to, uh, no, matter, no matter who they are out there. Look at the big picture and push for change, push for awareness, push for more funding, and push for more, like Elon had said, infrastructure and support for people with dementia. You know, cure is nice, I guess one last question I do want to pose. Who thinks there's going to be a cure in their lifetime? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> and that's pretty much what I, what I hear from everybody. So in the meantime, uh, you, uh, you think it'll be in your lifetime? No, no, no. I want to say something. Oh, okay. It, I'm like, I don't, but I'm 62. So, you know. <laughs> when, well, and I'm almost 50. So but when the time, you know, when you ask the question again, it's not just Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. it's other forms of dementia. Exactly. And there's mixed dementia, different types of, and there's many people have misdiagnosed So, you know, when we talk about it, we have to put the full, we, we have to tell the whole story. Yeah. People think about only about Alzheimer's disease. And what about the early onset Alzheimer's disease? You know, so it's a much broader question, right? Um, than, than that, but, but anyway, I think it's a very important question, you know, I, I'm all for efforts for cure. It's not about that. It's about balance. Mm -hmm. It's about balance. People are struggling right now. Anyways, sorry. <laughs> yep. A neurodegenerative diseases, we'll put it that way. But yeah, good, very good point, because we're so used to using that term and assuming that everybody knows that it's it's broader than that. So again, thank you all so much. And I hope people enjoy this conversation. You know, feel free to to write us on what topics you'd like to hear 
Ramos, or what are your thoughts on this? And we will go from there. But like, click, and share, and pass the work on of Dementia Chats and our wonderful panelists that aren't afraid to speak up and speak out. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you all.